Hello everyone and welcome to the 2021 Open House Faculty Panel. My name is Megan Mihailo and I'm a senior studying Industrial and Systems Engineering. Hi everyone, my name is Gabby and I am a sophomore studying Biomedical Engineering. We will be the moderators for today's panel. Today we will be showcasing the cutting edge research taking place right here at Rutgers Engineering. We will be focusing on research involving specifically AI and machine learning. So what exactly is AI? For me personally, the first thing that comes to mind is robots and computers taking over the world. We've seen all the movies or heard stories, but AI encompasses so much more than that. Yeah, AI and machine learning is the usage of programming to metaphorically teach computers how to do the tasks that are typically done by humans. A majority of the media portrays this as not only applying to robots, but that's only scratching the surface. There's healthcare, self-driving cars, manufacturing, and agriculture are just some examples that AI and machine learning can advance. We'll be showing you guys a short video that showcases the endless possibilities of AI. When Internet of Things, along with big data, meets artificial intelligence, this interface will become enlivened with intelligence and a new world will take birth, which will increasingly talk back to us. Imagine the kind of world that it would be. Imagine the revolution that will usher in the way we see the world. The external world will become the extension of our mind, like an extension of our thoughts. Imagine a world that is responsive, a world that is optimized for human creativity, a world that is intelligent. The Internet of Things is a breeding ground for new AI-driven solutions and experiences, from self-driving cars to intelligent homes to health. Welcome to the world of endless possibilities. So fortunately, we do have faculty here at Rutgers that are firsthand using AI and machine learning to push boundaries of science, just shown in the video. Before they talk about their research, let us introduce them. So first is Dr. Ozell. Dr. Ozell is a tenured professor at, in the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department here at Rutgers. He's currently teaching automation and artificial intelligence enabled manufacturing inside the Industrial Engineering Department. He earned his bachelor's in aeronautical engineering from the Istanbul Technical University and his PhD in mechanical engineering with a manufacturing focus at Ohio State University. Dr. Ozell's research program focuses on advanced manufacturing, smart manufacturing, metal additive manufacturing, and 3D printing using physics-based simulation modeling and machine learning methods. So next we have Dr. Fabrice, and she is an associate professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. She received her bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in chemistry from the University of Padova in Italy. She also spent three years at the University of California, Santa Barbara as a postdoc. Dr. Fabrice's lab rationally designs plasmonic nanomaterials to address biologically and medically relevant questions, and most recently, to design efficient nanostructured photocatalysts. In this respect, she leverages AI to interpret complex spectroscopic responses of molecules, in particular disease biomarkers, and to identify unexplored parameters in space and in the synthesis of nanoparticles. Next is Dr. Ortiz. Um, Dr. Ortiz is a assistant professor in the electrical and computer engineering department here at Rutgers University, where he directs the cyber physical intelligence lab and is a member of the wireless information network laboratory, or as known as WinLab. He attained his PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley, his master's in computer science from Berkeley as well, and his um, master's in computer science from MIT. His work focuses on building and studying sensing systems that learn about human behavior from human feedback um, and with humans to improve system objectives and enhance people's lives. And we also have Professor Gormley. He is an assistant professor in biomedical engineering here at Rutgers. He obtained his PhD in bioengineering from the University of Utah in the laboratory of Professor Hamed and his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Lehigh. 
His research um, is all about nano nanobiomaterials. He started the Gourmet Lab, which seeks to develop bioactive nanobiomaterials using robotics and artificial intelligence. So now that we've introduced our amazing faculty participating today, let's hear about them talk about their research and how they incorporate AI into their projects. Dr. Azel, would you like to begin? Sure. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning has been around for some time. And with the help of new sensors, sensor technology, and data streaming and big data, uh, with the new mathematical methods and computational methods. Now that it's the time to integrate AI and machine learning to uh, our everyday lives. Similar to this, we also actually use machine learning and AI in order to improve our research. For example, we study human machine tool uh, collaboration, a human working side by side with the machines and AI is the um, enabler in order to allow the uh, data to be collected from the machine tool and analyze the data through data analytics and show the user operator what um, is going on in the machine. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is to develop digital twin. Digital twin is essentially a simulation model <clears throat> or a digital model uh, of a physical object <clears throat> or a physical system. So in this case, a uh, digital model learns from the physical object continuously and makes calculations and provides a feedback to the physical system so that the physical system uh, improves the operations. And finally, we use physics-based simulation. Simulation-based engineering has become quite popular because we have more computational tools. So in this aspect, <clears throat> we develop physics-based simulation models using machine learning. Machine learning component essentially learns from the physics of the process and creates a computational models, for example, deep learning models or finite element simulation models uh, combined with the data, uh, provides a better prediction capability for the user, for the engineers to design the processes, to improve the operations of the processes and to optimize the output outcome, for example, cost savings or the um, being able to produce them in a, a short period of time. So we use various kinds of uh, computational models using finite difference methods, finite element methods, and using uh, machine learning and AI tools such as neural networks, um, uh, clustering for analyzing the data, and also um, some statistical learning methods such as reinforcement learning. Uh, we reward the learning by providing some uh, uh, improvements to the uh, algorithm. And also in return, we obtain simulation to provide us a better digital uh, model of the system. Now we apply this specifically with my expertise in the manufacturing systems and manufacturing processes such as machine tools, so that we can predict the machine tool's behavior and what uh, components are about to fail and we can replace them, as well as we can uh, look at the novel advanced manufacturing techniques, um, such as uh, laser part bed fusion thermal simulation models. Yes, please, next slide. And machine learning uh, is used for predicting the surface and also process relation, uh, also used for um, process monitoring so that we can use cameras and data stream in order to monitor the laser powder material interaction, as well as we can use process control methods to detect the defects on the surfaces uh, during the manufacturing process. Before something bad happens, we can actually provide a feedback and intervene the process or change the process parameters to obtain a better uh, outcome. We apply that, uh, as you can see here in the examples, uh, in uh, uh, surface topography predictions, as well as uh, thermal simulation uh, modeling. 
So I, I hope that you understand the uh, impact of machine learning and AI in the manufacturing setting. And this is where my expertise is. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna take over after this uh, great introduction. Uh, as um, a material scientist and a chemist, my group focuses primarily on developing nanomaterials with the purpose of using them to study how our body you know, produces biomarkers uh, of disease and how we can better detect them in order to render more uh, uh, approachable and more available low cost uh, techniques of, of disease detection to everybody. So in, in this, in the top left corner, what you see is actually a three dimensional reconstruction of a nanoparticle that we collected with what is called transmission electron microscope. And these nanoparticles are very interesting because by using finite element models, as uh, our previous um, speaker um, reported, we can actually reconstruct how electric field interacts with these particles and how the changes in the morphology allow the field to be amplified around the particles. These particles, because of their shape, think about antennas, they amplify the electric field on their surface very highly, even um, uh, 10 to the two, 10 to the three, 10 to the four times. So 100, uh, 10,000 10, times more than what the field was coming in. And so this in turn allows us to amplify the signal that the technique that we use called surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy gives up. To give you an example, many times when we want to detect uh, a disease biomarkers, we are really stuck because the concentrations of these biomarkers are very low. Think about um, many times, if you, you may have heard someone unfortunately having to go to a biopsy. So a biopsy really goes in the body, pre, you know, extracts a piece of tissue, which can be very painful, and then looks at how the properties of this tissue can indicate the presence of a disease. What we do in my research, in our research, is actually we try to transfer this biopsy of tissue to what is called the liquid biopsy. So liquid biopsy basically allows us to use only blood, urine, or saliva to look for the same biomarkers. However, these biomarkers are present in much lower concentration, so we definitely need to amplify their signal. So when when the signal is amplified by the nanoparticles, what we can do by using uh, the surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy signal, we can actually uh, understand how the signal is evolving and, and get an indication of whether a patient is getting better or getting worse, or, or, or even before the disease onset, onset is evident, we can actually predict if a person will become sick. So we use AI in, in, in my lab for two purposes. On one hand, we actually use AI to design these nanoparticles. Obviously, we know that if we physically go to the lab, if you've ever done any chemistry lab of having, having, having any, any time done, even cooked, baked something, you know that you can only modify one condition, two conditions at a time. So this makes it very impossible for us to really understand what is going on with all the conditions, all the parameters that we may use to discover even better particles. So we use AI to understand how current properties of the nanoparticles we, do, we design based on the conditions of the experiments can predict in the future what would be other parameters that we should explore to get even better performing particles. The other interesting aspect in which we use AI is basically leveraging uh, 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 neural networks in particular, uh, but we are still exploring new algorithms to better understand this concept because the fields of material science and chemistry have, have gotten to the AI part of the work a little bit later than other communities, but basically we try to understand how to interpret very complex spectra like you see here you see on the bottom of the of the slide bottom left you see the spectra with all these peaks so when you look at the blood or the urine spectra they are even more complicated so we use ai to to understand the composition of this spectra and understand where they come from and in the future predict uh, how to interpret 
the the blood uh, the blood uh, spectra obtained from a patient just by looking at them very quickly. And we can do that both to look at cancer disease and for more recently, we have been starting looking at viral infections. So this is how we have been using, um, we are using AI to, to study uh, interpretation of, of, of uh, biomarkers of disease and to design nanoparticles that allow us to do so. Thank you. Hi, so um, my name is uh, Professor Jorge Ortiz. I'm an assistant professor in the ECE department. Um, so I am the lead PI for the Cyber Physical Intelligence Lab. Uh, the focus of the lab is to build sensing systems that learn uh, from engagement with humans. So, you know, my uh, main, the, the main er uh, area of expertise of the lab is in sensing technologies and, and you know, often referred to as IoT. And the idea of IoT is to take sensors that are embedded in the physical world where people interact with systems. So for instance, systems being um, your, the, the, the sensors in your car, so you're, you're interacting with the car directly and indirectly. Uh, in buildings, uh, I work a lot in buildings, so you can consider how you know, the fact that we, are, we do all of our work in buildings um, the building is designed to essentially make you comfortable, productive, and healthy. Um, and, and even more broadly speaking, within uh, uh, urban systems. So, you know, just your presence in a city, you're interacting with the various sensing technologies throughout the city as they, as they either track you or as you, you know, in New York City, you might swipe your Metro card. Um, uh, as you open and, 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 and close doors. And so really the idea of what we're studying in the lab is how we can make those systems more adaptable and more engaging with humans directly to build better services and the services of tomorrow. Um, in terms of the types of projects that we're looking at in the lab, we have one, for instance, that's looking at, uh, at the cityscape. And so the cityscape being you know, using the video, uh, LIDAR, and various types of sensing technologies throughout the city to make, um, for instance, uh, uh, street crossing more safe, right? So for instance, if someone with a disability is trying to cross a street, can we identify that they have, uh, that they're a little bit slower at crossing, that perhaps they're an older adult with, with, uh, with, uh, with a device that, that shows that they have uh, a, a kind of disability that's making it harder for them to cross the street and coordinate with the rest of the urban system to, per, for instance, send a signal that, that, um, that we should give them more time to cross the street. So that requires you know, that the system sort of identify that there is a person in the, in the crosswalk um, using computer vision technology, that they classify the various kinds of um, that they that they uh, determine their posture, uh, for instance, that they determine that their posture and gait indicates that there is you know uh, difficulty, uh, or, or or perhaps that that it's um, it indicates that the, that you know the person is either older or having has uh, has some kind of disability that's making it harder for them to cross the street uh, more quickly, um, and then pushing that control back into the system itself so that the, the traffic around it can coordinate with the lengthened uh, crosswalk time. So another project that we're working on is on a smart pillbox. So we go from the very big to the very small. Uh, we have a project uh, where we designed a smart pillbox where we uh, embedded these commodity off the shelf sensors onto a 3D printed pillbox and uh, we use it for medication adherence. So it turns out that when uh, you interact with your pillbox, your the way in which you interact with it and the uh, the vibration pattern that is derived from that pillbox is unique to you. And so we use machine learning techniques to uh, essentially classify who is interacting with the pillbox when they interacted with it. Um, there's a big problem in the United States with medication adherence. It leads to lots of um, uh, issues with hospitalization. Um, there's another 
uh, project we're working on where we're looking in, in cars. And, and what, what we're trying to do is design agents that interact with people intelligently. So it determines when's a good time to interrupt them, to ask them things and to give them direction. And so we use cameras, physiological measurements, measurements in the car to essentially build a big machine learning model that you see here on the, on the lower right hand corner. So we're doing a bunch of uh, exciting AI work that integrates sensing uh, with human feedback. And, um, and there's a lot of projects to come as well. So we're, we're very excited with, uh, with the direction we're taking the, the work in the lab. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Professor Adam Gormley. I'm an assistant professor in biomedical engineering. So we uh, are in a lab that is fundamentally inspired by, uh, by biology. So if you think of yourself uh, as human beings, as uh, organisms made up of cells, these cells are actually made up of individual proteins. And so if you think of proteins almost as kind of building blocks, almost like Legos in some regard, the way we kind of look at human ph physiology is how can we design materials, artificial synthetic materials, to either directly interface with these uh, protein building blocks, these Legos, or how do we design materials that actually mimic some of the structure and functions of these uh, protein materials in order to maybe complement human health and enhance it to some extent. And so um, there's been a lot of people for a long time looking at developing these kind of uh, biomimetic synthetic materials. The challenge has always been in the past that these are very complex systems, right? Um, the fact that these proteins are enormously diverse and complicated building blocks means that interfacing with this machinery is very challenging and very uh, uh, multidimensional. And so the way that my lab has been approaching this problem is we're using a combination of robotics plus machine learning to autonomously design and synthesize and test and learn on these individual materials to see if we can en enhance their properties to some extent. I'll give you a very basic example. There are certain uh, therapeutic proteins that uh, many people depend on for maintaining their human health, but these proteins are enormously um, basic, um, uh, they're very sensitive to temperature, and so they easily fall apart. And so what we're interested in doing is designing synthetic materials, nanomaterials, that kind of wrap themselves around these very unstable therapeutic proteins in order to give them kind of like a stabilized shell. And the way we do this is by um, uh, in employing this kind of um, intelligent polymer automation. These materials that we make are polymer-based, not too dissimilar from proteins. And this robotic platform, which is driven by the machine learning, goes through an entire experimental workflow, synthesizes the materials, tests them, learns about their properties, and then decides on new material designs for future testing. And so the work that we do in our lab is very diverse uh, and very interesting. And if you are interested in learning more, feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, professors, for sharing your research. It's so inspiring to hear about the cutting edge science that's taking place here at Rutgers. We are now moving on to our questions. So our first question for you all is, what impact are you hoping to have with your research and what do you think it will help solve and improve? Dr. Ozell, would you like to start us off again? Sure, my research uh, focuses on uh, understanding advanced manufacturing processes, uh, systems, and machine tools, and bringing some computational models in order to make uh, manufacturing smarter. And by doing so, we develop various kinds of physics-based simulation models using methods including uh, finite element simulations, finite element methods, as well as machine learning methods, for example, neural networks, using data produced by uh, or collected by sensors or produced by the simulations, and comparing them to minimize the error difference between, so that we, have, we can build some predictive capabilities. So AI powered, or machine learning powered applications can turn the raw data collected from sensors or from the simulation models into useful predictions, such as when a piece of equipment will fail and need to be replaced. So the impact of my research is to improve the way that we produce products 
the way that we design products and the way that we use uh, the products with a longer period of time for sustainability, improved sustainability, energy conservation, as well as being able to uh, use advanced materials for enabling new products. That sounds so awesome. Dr. Fabrice, what about you? So for me, when I, when I finished my PhD now many, many years ago, and I started my research as a postdoc, I started using the technique that we use now, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And what I realized is that it was a technique that was just used in the lab. We had physicists, some chemists, you know, that's it. And it was a technique that has so much potential, especially since I started working on it to detect biomarkers and to look at DNA and proteins. And so my dream has always been that before I retire, I would like to see that technique really in included in the clinical st studies in the medical field because it could really integrate, maybe not replace clearly, but integrate some of the way we disease, diagnose diseases. And so all the work that we have been doing over the years, you know, together with, you know, much more interest from, you know, the medical field, many technological improvements that have reduced the cost of the equipment as have made it much more realistic that one day our approach, our studies will actually help integrating the tools that doctors have to really predict diseases and also reduce the cost. Uh, my group is primarily very interested in looking at how to help, you know, low income countries, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, some, some countries in South America to really, that are more remote as environments to, and even communities in our country, right? They don't have access to really high healthcare quality. And so to make these people uh, healthier and to help them live longer. And so that is my dream that our research will help solve this conundrum. Thank you so much. Dr. Ortiz. So <clears throat> I think uh, my, so my research uh, is, uh, I think the biggest impact that, that it could have, for instance, is um, fundamentally understanding how to make agents, intelligent agents interact more naturally with humans. Um, I think one of the big perspectives in the lab is treating our environment as a, a basically a big robot. And what does it mean for this big robot to interact with you? How do you make that more natural? How does the robot sort of both implicitly and explicitly determine how it's doing, right? Is it is it doing something that's annoying you? Is it um, how, how does it learn from you and get feedback? How does it build a relationship with you, essentially? Um, and, and to do that, I think uh, the way that we're using machine learning is to really try to model uh, human responses to robot actions. Um, in the context of buildings, this becomes really important, so very application dependent. In the context of buildings, it becomes really important because one of the things that's not very well understood is the way that the way that people interact with buildings uh, impact the efficiency of buildings. Buildings consume 40% of the energy in the United States. Um, you know, they, they're um, huge, uh, they're hugely inefficient, uh, wasting 50 to 80% of the energy they consume. And, and we're seeing now with the pandemic that they're also being used very differently. If we could only make the building more adaptive to the new occupancy patterns that we're seeing uh, the sparsity with which uh, populations are coming into buildings um, within the car, making the car safer. Uh, you know, uh, again, understanding the the difference between wanting to be interrupted and and the safety. You know, when it's safe to interrupt. Uh, we have a recent recent work that that basically builds a model to identify both of those things. And so, I think broadly speaking, just the notion of IoT and 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 machine learning and AI together. Uh, is really creating the sort of environments of tomorrow uh, that will allow people to more easily uh, interact with systems and to essentially make uh, our environments adaptable to us. Uh, so that's that's what I hope the um, the impact of my work has long term. Thank you so much for sharing, and Dr. Gormley. Yeah, so I would say that we have kind of two sets of goals. Uh, one is very practical and tangible, and one that se really seeks to improve human health. I mentioned the example earlier of trying to stabilize therapeutic proteins that are um, very challenging to deliver to patients all around the world. So I would say that, you know, there's a whole suite of 
problems very similar to that that our research is aiming to solve from perhaps a more aspirational perspective and kind of a longer looking um, impact on society, as I mentioned, we're really interested in basically taking a look at the natural world as well as the engineered world, the, the synthetic world that we create as engineers and see how we can kind of blend those two worlds together as much as possible. And like I mentioned, that happens really at the protein level. And so seeing how we can kind of complement our natural world with our engineering tools is something that is very aspirational to us. And what we actually do with that in the long run is, is only for uh, perhaps um, our dreams. Um, but in the future, we're looking forward to seeing what ultimately happens once we are able to do that, in fact. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. We're going to move on to our next question. So our next question is, what is the future of AI in your field? Uh, same order, Dr. Rizal, would you like to start? Sure. Um, the future of AI uh, in, in my field is becoming stronger and stronger because um, I am in the industrial engineering field. And industrial engineering today all means the to us as data, the more data, big data, the giant data, and you know, overwhelming data. So AI is the only way to handle this data. So AI is going to become uh, very uh, strongly integrated in many different subjects that we teach in our classes, industrial engineering. We, uh, we um, do research in our labs um, because of the availability of data. So data is now streamlined so automatically comes to you, whether you look at it or you don't look at it. In fact, my colleague was saying that most of the energy is wasted. I think today most of the data is also wasted. We actually um, took the liberty not to look at the data. So I think in the future, we're going to see AI is actually taking a bigger role, automatically um, integrating this data into our everyday lives. And our roles as engineers do this more ethically, ethically as ethically as possible, so that we can actually uh, make uh, you know wise decisions, use the data and AI for better decision making to improve our everyday lives, teach our students better subjects, uh, improve the products that we design, the products that we introduce as engineers uh, that are more dependable, more reliable, and more functional. So AI's role in the future is going to be very strong uh, on the engineering uh, applications, in my opinion. Very for good, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I was just <laughs> okay, jumping again. So for uh, in, in, in material science and chemistry, right, as I was saying before, we have sort of waited a little bit longer than other communities to really start approaching AI and machine learning. But I think that now, um, everybody understand the power that that this this discipline has. Um, not only you know we we are makers of things from like the molecular level. There are a lot of elements whose stability we don't know. A lot of molecules that we don't even know exist, or a lot of materials uh, in any forms and shape. So from the material standpoint, understanding you know, like I was saying before, how to predict what parameter spaces we should explore to design new materials is, is very powerful. As, and as Dr. Garmley was saying before, you know, there is so much we can predict right now, but who knows what will happen. I think there is a lot of excitement um, in our field for what AI uh, is going to bring to us. But I think also we have very, very, we've been cautioned by some of the mistakes that we have made as a community uh, and now we're sort of stepping back a little bit and understanding, you know, what is really the inverse problem you're trying to solve? What, what is really the physical, what are the physics and chemistry fundamental things that we are addressing? Is there a law that allows these, these to be justified? You know, we cannot only expect to use algorithms and look at the fit. And then, yeah, this is the answer. Now we have to really do a lot of thinking. And so I think that our community is doing this. We are teaching ourselves how to think, how AI can be used. And then I think it's gonna be even more explosive what can be brought in the future. And I'm really excited about it. Thank you so much. Um, I think Dr. Ortiz, you're next. Um, so 
I think I think there's sort of um, I mean I think AI with IoT is uh, very closely intertwined. Uh, in terms of the field itself, I think one of the uh, one of the one of the ways in which uh, AI is going to evolve as it merges with with sensing is the fact that AI in the real world doesn't work quite as well as we might expect. And um, so we, you know, I think one of the things that we'll see as, as we, you know, when, when we integrate sensing technology into AI is really to understand what the limits are of these models, how we deal with noise, how we deal with uncertainty. Um, that's one of the, I, I think in terms of uncertainty, integrating humans into that question is fundamental because ultimately systems are making decisions without humans in the loop. And what we're considering for the future of AI is how we integrate that feedback and essentially make it collaborative. And what does it mean from the eight, from a human perspective, there's a whole area of human computer interaction that considers that. From the uh, AI perspective, it's a question of algorithmically, what does it mean to, to get feedback? What does it mean to build models for interruptibility? What does it, what does it mean? How do we identify it? How, how do we make it interpretable? Right? How do we know why it made a decision and maybe even explain it to the human of why you went in that direction? So there's a lot of open questions, I think, that uh, our field will help advance um, in AI. And, and AI is already playing a, a major role. So uh, yeah. Thank you so much. And Dr. Gormley, would you like to take it away? Sure. So I think that in the examples of the research being done by Dr. Ortiz and Ozell is that you know, they have an abundance of data, right? So they are perhaps more algorithmically looking at what are the ways that we don't waste this data. In the biomaterials world, we have actually the opposite problem, that we don't have enough data, right? So AI and, and machine learning has long been considered in my community as a potential tool to unlock some of the, the uh, aspirational goals that I mentioned earlier, but we've just never really had a streamlined set of information that we could use to populate these models. And so um, I, I think that the need and the understanding that we need these tools is there. So what we see in our community is actually a major effort right now towards standardizing our experiments and trying to make the data accessible for everybody. So that way when we actually do these experiments, the data is comparable between labs and so that we can communicate with one another. And once we start to create these kind of standardized sets of information, then we can really effectively use tools such as machine learning and AI to design new biomaterials that interface with biological systems. So I think that's ultimately the future. Thank you so much. And now we're gonna move on to our final question for you guys. And that is, how have undergraduate students contribute to your work and or how can they get involved? Very good question. Um, in Rutgers Engineering, we actually work with the undergraduate students in our research projects. There are ways to do that. One of the ways to do that is the RST research program. And I've had uh, several uh, research assistants in the past uh, working in the uh, RST research projects, uh, working with the graduate students and myself in the lab. And uh, all of those uh, uh, examples I showed about my research involved undergraduates. So the, what the undergraduates do, they come a few hours and work in the lab and they learn the first of all problem. Typically this is one of the manufacturing processes that we study. For example, laser powder bed fusion. And in this case, laser is actually processing a powder material inside a powder bed. And then they actually look at the numerical methods to analyze this. So one example I can give that one student, uh, she worked on modeling um, the um, uh, high uh, speed, high frame rate images um, collected from the videos. And then uh, she analyzed this and then uh, correlated by using a machine learning method, a color contour map, so that we can identify where the laser creates a hot spot, which is the male pole, and also around the vicinity of the male pole, what would be the material spatter, and, and that would be uh, the material that is actually departed from the male pole. So she identified this by using a 
method, mathematical method, and she found that integrating her subjects into this research was really a good opportunity through this undergraduate research program. Dr. Fabrice? So um, I have had a lot, a lot, many undergraduate students involved in, in my lab for over the past decade or so, a little bit more now. Uh, and it's always been very thrilling for me to see how much they have been accomplishing, you know, and what they do after they leave. And so, you know, uh, the RST program is, is very important because it allows the student to really think about ways to design their own projects. If they have particular interests, you know, they, they can, you know, have some funding to carry out their own project. But also students that do not access research through the RST can have great opportunities in the lab, either during the academic year or during the summer. The students have contributed to a various set of, of, of goals. And, you know, many the majority of the time spending time with a um, graduate student mentor or a postdoc mentor, collecting data, understanding the problem, really being active part of the everyday research activities that we do in the lab. In terms of getting involved, I know I often receive questions from my students saying, or even my the students I lecture in class, you know, I'm a little shy. I don't know if I should email the professor. You know, I don't know. I think many times students email the professors and we don't respond, but it's not because we don't want to, it's because we are drowning in emails. So please reach out to us again. Set up a time, talk to us. I mean, if we do not respond, it's not because we want to be mean. We just, you know, our hands are very full. And many times, unfortunately, some emails, you know, go through and we don't read them. So please do not feel any time shy or worried and, and reach out to us. I think that would be the first step. And once when you see that we're actual human beings, you know, having their own issues, you know, we can actually have a constructive relationship and really start talking face to face and be really partners in what we do. Thank you so much for the advice. Dr. Ortiz, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, actually, I, I uh, agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I've also had many undergraduates in my lab. Uh, I've been at Rutgers is my third year. And since the beginning, I've had undergraduates in my in my lab through JJ Slade, through LSAMP, and through various uh, organizations on campus. In general, I have a pretty open door policy in my lab. So like, if you're an undergraduate who wants to get involved, I invite you to group meetings. And I say, well, just sit in and figure out if, if you know, okay, you read my bio or whatever, but that's only scratching the surface, just come hang out. And if you see something you like, talk to me about it, reach out to the grad students. It's vi I sort of have this, I try to create an environment in my lab where you know, it's okay, to, it's okay to dabble, it's okay to not know. I encourage experimentation. Um, it's very, my lab, the work we do in our lab sort of spans hardcore machine learning and modeling, you know, which usually the grad students are, are in, knee deep in and more system building. And some of the system building stuff could be like building a website and just getting involved with some of the low hanging fruit kind of work that most of the undergraduates can can start with. Um, I've had undergraduates who stay at that level, and I've had undergraduates recently who were involved in publications. Um, so some have started off with building a website for some application we're building, and then have gone on to admit to me that they'd really like to do more of the hardcore ML stuff. And so they do, and they help out with that. So um, I, uh, the other thing I want to echo is is that we are drowning in email. And so it's not always the case that we don't want to answer. It really is that we, you know, I, I will literally see an email and be like, oh yes, I have to get back to this person. And then I remember it three weeks later. Oh my God, I was supposed to get back to so-and-so. Uh, oh, well, you know, I don't, now I can't find the email because that was 3000 emails ago or something, you know, it was, you know. So I do encourage students to be proactive about seeking them out. And I think in a lot of cases, you will find professors who are pretty open to just coming and having you see what's going on. Uh, so. Yeah, I encourage students to, to, to contribute and to get involved. Thank you so much. And Dr. Gormley, do you want to wrap us up? Sure, absolutely. So um, like everybody in this panel, my lab has a lot of undergraduates who help out with projects. Uh, maybe I'll give one inspirational example. We have an undergraduate student who actually did their senior design project in my lab and um, you know, really took on the project. Basically, the goal 
was to develop um, you know, a, um, a program to control a robotic arm to be able to transfer samples between instruments on a big optical table. Uh, originally, I set my expectations very low, but that student within one month far exceeded my expectations and actually built a software suite to control all of the um, synthetic and analytical instrumentation that are on our robotic platform. And this student got really interested in the research, obviously would never been able to accomplish so much in such a short period of time. Ultimately, now uh, that student has moved on to do their master's in my lab. And they are also now involved in helping us form a startup company. So he's engaged with us in um, <clears throat> a program called iCorp. It's spelled I-C-O-R-P-S. So it's spelled, pronounced iCorps, but it's actually pronounced as iCorp. And it's an NSF program, which Rutgers has a program here, um, a site program, that allows you to um, get engaged and also try to translate your research into the marketplace and do business model development. And so for the students that are listening to this who perhaps have entrepreneurial aspirations, um, independent of a lab, I encourage you to get engaged with the i program because it's really a fulfilling experience in terms of um, you know, understanding the business side of things as well. Thank you so much, everyone. That about wraps up our panel. Thank you for taking the time out of your day, faculty for attending, watchers to view this. Uh, we wanna again, thank our amazing faculty for sharing such valuable information. We hope you learned something new about either AI or Rutgers and how they both can influence and push the boundaries of science. For more information, please look in the video description for links, the ambassador program, and anything else you can find down there. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye.